time for another military history q and I'm sorry it's been taking me a little while, but I'm really busy trying to edit stuff from when I was in Europe filming for you guys. Now, you've asked me about strange and interesting World War II German infantry weapons, or weaponry in general that does not involve rockets and flying around strange things. Remember, you only bring that on yourself, because now you have given me an excuse to use terms as Donkey Faust. And I will say Donkey Faust as long as I think it's funny, and I still think it's funny. It was a real thing, I absolutely promise you. There was, it was a real thing, and we'll get to that. But let's start with uh, Balls of Steel. I'm also not kidding, really. We're going to start with the Kugelpanzer, which sort of has its origin back to World War I, where the Germans built the Treffeswagen. World War I was a time where the tank began its, uh, its life, really. We had to find an armored way to cross trenches, and a whole lot of different designs and ideas were tested and tried, and a lot of them ended up sort of on the garbage heap of history. The Treffeswagen was one of them. One was built. Uh, by one of the German firms. It was to be equipped with either a small cannon in the center, rifles side, several rifles. It was had a four-man crew. It weighed 18 tons and had three meter tall uh, rather cylindric wheels that was also part of the side of the tank. Um, it was about eight kilometers of uh, wandering speed. It was tested. It had a little rear wheel that would account for steering. And that design we're going to see again when we get to the Kugelpanzer. And I feel that the Kugelpanzer is kind of interesting, because we don't know a whole lot about it, but from looking at it and knowing a little bit, you can kind of guess what it was. It was a one-man crew. It was under two tons. It had five millimeters of armor, so it was not really very well armored. It had a little vision port and had a machine gun to be fitted in the center. It's a little unclear exactly what it was, because there was only one prototype that we know of that was made that still exists today. It was even unclear where they found the thing. It's sitting at the Russian Kublinka Museum, outside Moscow, where it was hiding for several decades. They kind of gave it a strange paint that didn't belong and hid it behind a Tiger I, which is plausible. Uh, sitting next to a Tiger One, most things would sort of disappear, especially this little fella here. It, rumor was that it was a um, radio cable layer. I don't see enough space, I don't see cables going deep enough. I see a whole lot of reasons why that doesn't work, although being a cable layer during World War II was not exactly a good for your general health and well-being. So, infantry support? That was an option. It was built coming up to World War II. It was built by Krupp. We know that much. They have two stories of where the Russians captured this thing. One was in Manchuria. Manchuria. <laughs> Manchuria by the, captured from the Japanese, which would mean that the Germans had built this round, rather large ball uh, in, during the war. Well, I presumably after they became allied with the Japanese and they had tested it and then they sent them their one prototype. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing that. I, I, I don't buy it. I don't buy it will be there. I don't buy it will be in Manchuria. However, the other story seems to be a lot more plausible, uh, that it was captured at the Kumasdorf Proving Ground where they also captured the mouse, which is sitting in the same museum. I find that plausible. Germans were testing a lot of different interesting things, but this four little infantry support vehicle had a two-stroke engine, could go six, seven kilometers an hour, and was two large rotating wheels would propel it forward at some speed or not. No word if it'll be clad with uh, with rubber to for a little bit of better traction, but um, I think the Kugelpanzer is interesting, and apparently it was interesting enough that a lot of other countries were kind of experimenting with this thing. We were, and after the war, the Russians were, rumored, everything online is a rumor, right? Rumored was, and there are, I have seen design drawings, of a Stalin ball of steel, 500 ton Kugelpanzer, that they were going to build with 
cannons and everything. I don't think it made it off the design table. But they were also experimenting with smaller uh, balls. So maybe that's why they hit it, because they were working on something similar. Sort of like when the uh, Horton wing was sitting in a museum for a long time here in America until the uh, B-2 flying wing came out, and then it sort of disappeared for a little while. Gee, we don't want to telegraph where we get our ideas now, do we? Anyway, the big wheel idea wasn't really new, and it didn't really stop at World War II, because the, uh, the Germans, they kind of built other things with large, enormous wheels. They built the Minenraumer. Again, Kulp 1944. It was a huge mine-clearing vehicle. Articulate in the center, two independent parts, both had engines. They were fueled by the HL90, uh, my back. And it had enormous two meters and seven, almost three meter tall wheels with huge armored plates on them to literally just roll over the mines, detonate them, and remain unscathed. And the front wheels and the rear wheel was uh, off-center, so they could care or clear more, uh, more ground. Now, very, very little about the Minenraumer has been found. I only found a few photos. I have no idea what happened with it. It was uh, confiscated, captured by the Americans after the war. No idea where it went. Uh, you can find very little data about it. But wait, there's more than there's this. The Schwerer Minenraumer. Ha <laughs> ha! Built by the Alcat factory. A three-wheel monster. It was 50 tons. I absolutely love this thing. It had a Panzer I turret on top. And it was armed between 20 and 40 millimeters of armor. It was just a beast. Um, well, mines are pretty crappy to have laying around. They tend to, you know, blow up some of these soft, squishy things that we call infantry. But in 1942 already, this was built by the Alcat factory, and we like the Alcat factory because they also built the Sturmgeschütz. And they, the VSKFC 617 Schwerer Minenraumer, means heavy, in case you hadn't guessed the 50 tons meant heavy. Um, it had a V12 uh, Maybach engine that just barely could push it down the road at 50 kilometers an hour. And one was built, which is also sitting at the um, Russian Museum, where incidentally they also found it at the Kumostov Proving Grounds. And I, this thing is just, I don't understand why someone have not made this in the movie, but big wheels, it is. And I thought that was interesting because in recent years, past decade, I seem to have seen a resurgence of articulate vehicles with a V-shaped hull for mine clearing, huge wheels, and a small cab up front. Uh, I'm thinking the Germans made something like that, and I seem to have seen some of the Danish mine clearing vehicles ah, around 2000. Uh, the 2000, the year. I've, I've seen a few that looked like it, where even back then I looked at it and go, like, wow, that looked like something the Germans built during the war. So, a good idea is a good idea. And mine clearing vehicles, let's just face it, they're kind of cool. Mines, not so much. The vehicles are, because they're super heavily armed. They're usually configured a little off, a little different. So, they kind of come off looking kind of cool. A little, uh, little transformer-ish here. And the, the Russians built a mine-clearing vehicle that I thought was really cool, where they had a MiG engine sitting on top, reversed, so the jet exhaust would plow up the ground and detonate the mines in front of it. I, I think it could possibly be done in a better way. I don't know how many they built of them, but it was kind of cool. Really, honestly. We're straight into the ray gun on that one, which is actually what I thought it was first time I saw it. Anyway, of course, then you also have the Goliath, which most of you have heard about, a uh, small tracked remote-controlled vehicle with a uh, explosive charge of between 60 and 100 kilograms. It would roll up to enemy tanks or bunkers and blow itself up. It was guided by a joystick, had three cables coming out the back, uh, 
through which two of them were steering and the last one for setting off the explosive. Problem was, it was not really very well armored. It was not by any means impervious to infantry fire, so if you saw it coming, you had enough shots, you would eventually disable it. And if you were a really good shot, you could, as some snipers were and are, you could shoot, a, shoot up the cable uh, and it would become immobile and it would just sit there. Uh, after the war, some 7,564 of them were built. After the war, the American Air Force actually used a few of them to tow planes. But they really were not built for that, so they kind of broke down rather quickly. They were a single-use weapon. So, okay, all right, fine. The Germans did over-engineer just about everything. It started with an electrical engine, which was really hard to maintain in the field, which is why they switched to a gasoline engine which was easier to maintain, but for the ones at D-Day, they actually were a kind of bunch of Goliaths that were sitting in small bunkers housed inside tunnels where they would send them out rolling towards the Allies on the beaches and blow themselves up. They had to start the engine inside the tunnel where the staff were and then send them off at the right moment, which means they would be sitting inside uh, slowly suffocating from the gasoline fumes. That was just particular stories from uh, from Normandy and a lot of them had a problem with they would come into guess what Normandy beaches there's a lot of bombs going off um, yeah right and a lot of holes from those bombs craters different things it would have a problem they get it into a bomb crater it would get stuck it only had a ground clearance of I think 11 centimeters uh, which is funny because I should know because one of my friends actually has one and he's working on making it run. It's fully restored and obviously we had it in one of our movies. Uh, had the whole unloading from the Kettenhaut and everything. Special teams were designed within the infantry to deploy these uh, at the different battle stations where, where they were used. They were used uh, quite a lot in Italy uh, and again also in, in Normandy. They were not the most successful thing they built. It was a little overpriced for what it was and what they got out of it. But Still, it became sort of the idea of the remote-controlled weapon systems uh, of the day, and one would think that given that we have radio-controlled weaponry the Germans made during the war, the radio-controlled uh, flying bombs, it wouldn't be a stretch that they could make a radio-guided uh, uh, Goliath over time that could, at least then the, the wires could not be uh, shot up, and better range maybe, a little bit more ground clearance, I don't know, just a thought, food for thought. Now I wanted to get the vehicles out of the way first because they're small vehicles and they would be operated by the infantry. But let's get back to what actually started this little step down in German weaponry. One of you wonderful people wrote me about how your grandfather was shot in the leg by a Sturmgewehr Krumlauf, which is the Sturmgewehr fitted with a curved battle barrel to shoot around corners. And much as I really wanted to reach out and reach back to you and get a little bit more information so I could sort of break down just exactly what the odds were uh, of any American soldier in that theater being shot by such a thing, which is phenomenally small because it's about Oh, the STG-44, which I'll get back to more details on in a minute, there are about 430,000 major in the war and a lot fewer of the curved barrel attachment that came in five different variations. So there are some thousands of those made. So it was a relative. I'm glad he survived the war. That's the most important thing. He made it back and he kept his leg. But it's a bit of a story to be shot by something that was relatively rare. It all started with uh, the STG-42, uh, actually with the Maschinenkabinen 42H. Obviously, 42 denotes the production year, and officers working under Albert Speer was working on a new replace, ideally an ideal replacement for the Mauser, which 12 million was in service with the German army at that time. Something with more rapid fire, lighter, cheaper to make, uh, 
problem is they used the 792 by 33 quartz, which is shorter and less powerful than the Mauser, which made it less efficient at uh, ranges. However, it was pointed out that most combat ranges still took place between two, three hundred meters or under. So you didn't really need 800 meter Mauser range all the time, especially when you needed something lighter, smaller for house to house fighting or in the cities. Anyway, that eventually turned into there's a lot of different versions of the STG uh, that became the STG 44. There was a version in 44, 42, 43, and 44. There was also one in 45. They're roughly the same rifle. What makes this different is, and believe it or not, when you look at it, this was a closed bolt firing system with it was a gas-operated, selective fire, closed bolt firing system, and it was pressed and stamped, which made it require less materials than actually making a bolt-action K98, which also make it, made it cheaper to produce. Of course, the inferiority of the ammunition initially was a bit of a setback. It's also said and stated in a whole bunch of reasons that the reason why this weapon was not brought to bear from 1942 when it was initially developed was that Hitler absolutely hated it and he stopped uh, the production, which is not entirely true. Hitler was a very much a hands-on uh, leader and he was inspect all the new weaponry as he could. Of course, during World War I, he was carrying the Mauser, so that's what he knew. Problem was, he was looking at a production of... Uh, this new weapon to replace the Mauser as it was initially suggested. The problem with that is you'd have to make 12 million of them real fast in order to replace the Mauser. The ammunition wasn't as powerful, which was a problem initially. Um, the Mauser was already out there and we're starting 1942-43 to start building these things. They were too short for a bayonet charge, so the bayonet mount eventually came off. And to change production around at a point where Germany was stressed production-wise already did not seem like a good idea to him. However, he did not cancel the research, as he could have, because they tried to sneak this under him. And they did it again, because then they revamped it when they realized this could not be a replacement to the Mauser. So they called it MP instead. And they tried to find a sell it as a replacement, or research as a replacement to the MP40, or upgrade as a machine pistol. Uh, Hitler also caught on to that one, but again he didn't cancel the project or the research and eventually when it was demonstrated to him he was rather impressed because it actually, after it's gone through its evolutions, became a very viable and well-made and cheaply made and well-functioning rifle. So he called it the Sturmgewehr. That was his idea. It is, in effect, it was, the world's first assault rifle. It was uh, selective fire, 450 rounds a minute, which is not too fast, so you're not going to expend all your ammunition uh, in a matter of seconds. It was the original father of what became the G3, became the MP5 series, the FN, if you will, and don't even go there with the AK-47. Don't even start with that because the STG-44 came first. And believe me, Kalesnikov, he saw this one before the AG AK-47 came out. We can argue that until the sun sets. This was still the first assault rifle that was ever made. And this was in order to assault forward, not as a defensive weaponry. Interestingly enough, a lot of stories was how they malfunctioned initially because when they left some of the factories, they were so heavily greased and because the soldiers at the front were very hard pressed, they would literally yank them from the crates, uh, tear off the wax paper, insert magazine, and have a problem firing because the barrels were greased up or the mechanism would freeze up. They would have to be cleaned extensively first. That's one of the misnomers of the STG. And interestingly enough, the U.S. Army, U.S. Ordnance, tested it after the war, and they had some. They, they found it slightly inferior, which I don't know if that was a sign of the time because, or it was just not tested well. 
because it, it certainly did the job, and it was supposed to be a counter to the PBSH-41 on the Russian front, where all these 9mm bullets seem to be flying you know, all sorts of different directions. They wanted something better with a higher rate of fire for close quarter combat, and that's where the STG-44 was perfect, <clears throat> and it did a good job. Now, what makes this interesting and why this is uh, coming on here special crazy German weapons was the Kumelov, which was a angled bore attachment. Now, they didn't build the STG-44 with a curved barrel. It was an insert that you would screw onto the existing barrel. You'd also have different optics, so you could see around corner and shoot from cover. There was a couple of different variations, a 30 degree, 45 degree, 60 degree, and a 90 degree angle. And at that point, you'd have to have little holes built in the curve for the exhaust gases to uh, evaporate because a lot of pressure was put on a bullet when it had to do a curve. And the 90 degree curve, as also per the US Army uh, afterwards uh, with the inventor, which was incidentally Smyser, who also did the MP40, uh, the 90 degree curved barrel was just too much. It would kick way too hard on more than three rounds the shooter would have even be spun around almost 90 degrees because as the bullet would turn it would exhaust such pressure on on the barrel and once out there it's be very hard to control the 30 degree barrel curved barrel attachment however seemed to be a bit more promising and worthy of more research and ever since we have tried to find a way to shoot around corners the Israeli have a very successful weapon they use now to shoot around corners, but it's, it, it's not a curved barrel. It is the whole gun that's curved in that sense. No comparison, still. Uh, there was also a curved barrel attachment and mount for uh, tanks or armor where you could put it in a mount and you could spread hose off your tank, so to speak. One problem there was with putting all this pressure on this poor little uh, short bullet was that they would almost always come out uh, deformed, which means you not have a pointy impact on your target. You'll have some, probably a little bit of a tumbling going on and a bent bullet already. It will still keep people's head down on the other end. Efficiency, hmm, it was worthy of more research, let's put it that way. But it was, it was an interesting concept of the day and it certainly did work about 300 rounds per barrel before the barrel would start deforming inside and pocket and it wouldn't be user-friendly anymore. Although the designer had expected a 6,000 uh, rounds to go through the barrel before he got to the point where it would no longer work. Um, another interesting thing about the STG-44, it was the first rifle that was fitted with an infrared uh, aiming device or infrared scope, or they would actually light up uh, infrared. And, well, for those who carry around an infrared scope on your little rifle now, and it weighs a few hundred grams, well, this thing was rather large. And not only that, you had to carry a battery in a pouch with a huge cable is running to, and you only had 15 minutes of operational time before the battery would run out. However, you were able to light up a complete dark forest, no, uh, no stars, no nothing, up to 200 meters of accurate fire. Also, of course, you had a flash suppressing cone, so you wouldn't blind the, uh, the shooter f uh, with, the, with the flash you would fire in the middle of the night. It was the first infrared scope that was developed, put on rifles. It was also put on tanks, trucks. Uh, vehicles where it was easier to carry heavy batteries, especially the Panther tank had, uh, had an infrared scope built at that time. Not really a strange weapon, certainly not by today, but then being able to shoot in the dark without being seen, that was something that was rather uh, innovative and important. Since well, the World War II, uh, the enemies could run around uh, in the darkness and do their things. Now you could actually snipe at them, but not more than 200 meters away, of course. 
And another note on this, the STG-44 was actually in use by some militaries all the way up until 1980. So, not really bad. And Serbia is still, I believe, to be the only country that still makes the, uh, the court the short round. For those of you who are lucky enough, you bastards, to have an original STG-44. For those who are not, um, GSG is making a 22 version of that and of the, uh, of the MP-40 as well. Uh, however, there's also a replica made, uh, I believe it's a company in Texas, that is now making STG uh, 9mm or even the original uh, quartz round. There was a couple of friends of mine that were gunsmiths out in Louisiana. They used to make an STG-44 replica that shot 5.56 ammo and used a HNK-91 lower to base it on. They were rather pricey though and I don't think they make them anymore. Of course, the MP-40, you still have companies like GSG that's making a 9mm that is readily available for five $600. Uh, well worth having just uh, for the sake of it and for reenactments. They're actually kind of cool Anyway speaking of just saying and now that we're speaking about the MP40 Well, we are now There's also a very special attachment that was made to the MP40 making it the MP40 slash 1 Not 2 because it was the first alteration what it was was a dual magazine attachment to the MP40. So you would actually have two magazines feeding into the gun. You would load two magazines and you would expend one and you would just push the other one over, rack the bolt, and continue fire. This was made for special operations, special forces, ambushes, and so on. Unfortunately, it also put the overall weight of the MP40 up to 12 pounds fully loaded. And it would, however, not require a whole lot of work or retooling to the original MP40 because you would just take the magazine housing out and replace that with one that would fit two magazines side by side. So it could be done fairly easy. Uh, there's very few of them were built and they were, the production was cancelled rather quickly because honestly, you save a little time, but you gain a lot of weight and it's a little bit more cumbersome. And you still have 30 rounds of, again, I think the MP40, 40 or 50 rounds a minute again, so you had a decent range of fire without expending your magazine in a few seconds. And it had a good weight and feel to it with one, so why do two? But at least they built one and they tried, and it actually did work, and it was easy to use. Um, I just thought that was an interesting note on the MP40, which is still very, very, very cool, and I really, really can't wait to get my hands on mine, which is across the country, because I live in California. Thank you. It can't all just be about bullets and guns. It has to be something that was bigger, and a predominant serious problem to having the German army and soldiers dismembered all over the various fronts was all these nasty planes that kept chasing them down and bombing them, which was apparently very unhealthy. So, research went into anti-aircraft weaponry and of course the Germans were cutting edge when it came to rockets so they made several infantry carried anti-aircraft uh, ground-to-air rocket launcher systems one was the Flieger Faust 1 which had uh, four barrels that fired at two centimeter rockets that theoretically should have a spread of 60 meter pattern and about 500 meter range that did not prove to be enough, so they added five more barrels, so now you had a 150 centimeter long, shoulder-fired, six and a half kilogram, total weight when loaded, uh, ground-to-air rocket launcher. It would fire the rockets in stages at 0.1 second difference, first uh, four and then five, so the rockets wouldn't get caught up in uh, the exhaust from the uh, from each other or from 90 gram project well, 90 gram projectiles and 19 grams of explosives. They would have velocity leaving the barrel at 380 meters a second. It would eventually attain the 500, six, uh, five to 600 meter uh, active uh, or efficient, efficient range, effective range of five to 600 meters with about a 
kill zone of 50, 40, 50, 60 meters. So you could fire them in the general direction that the plane would be or was going to be and hopefully you would hit it. Uh, only 80 of them actually made it into active duty, although 10,000 of them were uh, had been ordered. It was a very good idea. And there's a very famous uh, picture from the Brandenburg Gate where one of these are actually lying in uh, the rubble. See picture. If the war had lasted a little longer, a whole, whole new host of interesting and rather dangerous German weaponry would have been seen. They were also working on a Fliegerschreck, which was a rocket ammunition that contained 144 individual incendiary submunitions that could be fired from the uh, from the Panzerschreck. That would definitely have changed the battlefield somewhat if you could have an existing technology fitted with a uh, multi-submunition rocket launching uh, munitions. Something that we're seeing today. We see a lot of shoulder launched missiles uh, happening in the past uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years after the war, but this is sort of where they started. There was also a Fliegerfaust that was built with three centimeter munitions that were to be placed underneath the wings of aircrafts so the aircrafts could shoot inexpensive dummy munition at other planes. Uh, that only made it to the testing stage. But again, it's a technology we've seen past uh, post-war adopted by just about every uh, military ever since, or Air Force ever since that it is. But this is sort of where it is. And I know you all sit and say, well, he said Donkey Faust. When are we going to get to that? Calm yourself. We'll get to it. And now that we're talking about rockets and anti-tank and anti-plank weapons, we have to talk about something that is really, really special and really, really interesting because it still exists today in a slightly new reversed form. The Panzerabwehrraketen X-7 Rotkäppisch. Caption. Caption. Rotkäppchen. Right, red writing, never mind. The Panzerabwehrrakete X-7 was developed by BMW Company in 1941 already. Now this was interesting because what you're looking at is a wire-guided anti-tank weapon with a cone-shaped uh, detonator, 1200 meter range, 300 meters an hour, uh, man portable on the battlefield sitting on a one and a half meter long tripod, was visually guided by a tracer in the back this was a tow missile. That is exactly what it is. The warhead of the tow missile today is slightly bigger. 1941, that is exactly what BMW uh, had designed and offered to the uh, German Ordnance Bureau uh, for the price of research and construction of 768,000 Reichsmarks, which really is not much. Of course, at that time, the war was going really well for the Germans, so they said, uh, Thank you, but not right now. And imagine how much grief that cost them. Later on, development eventually was uh, put back in place, and they started building and constructing these things and testing them in 1944 with parts interchangeable from the Panzerfaust. It really seemed that the Germans were actually learning something. Interchangeable parts. When have you ever heard such nonsense when it comes to the World War II German Army? However, this was a two-stage solid rocket engine that would first fire one, and then after some flight, it would fire the second. It was a two-and-a-half-kilo-shaped two war, uh, warhead that would destroy pretty much any tank of that time, up to 1,200 meters range. The rocket engine was, uh, the first one had a... Uh, 1.3 kilos of uh, propellant, solid fuel, and the second had 6 kilogram propellant that would burn for 8 seconds. Not only that, it was also finned, it was guided by two wires, and it was so clever it would rotate twice per second. But the steering was accurate enough that, of course, if you have a missile that is uh, wire guided by the ailerons for like, like an airplane, well it would change its course when it is in that stage of rotation. That was taken into account. So it would only 
uh, steer horizontally when the horizontal planes were actually capable of steering horizontally. So it was a very, very technically sophisticated gyro-stabilized weapon system. Where was that? I'm sure a lot of German infantrymen were asking in 1943 when they found out it existed. Um, this was, for all intents and purposes, uh, the very precursor to, uh, to the tow missile system. One that I'm familiar with because in my initial young spry days uh, in the military I was an armored reconnaissance unit where we had tow missile systems, so I trained on that. Which incidentally is also sitting on a tripod. I seem to vaguely remember it, it was freezing as cold when I trained on that thing. Uh, on about a one and a half meter long tube. But this was, uh, this was an interesting weaponry that was uh, looked very carefully at by the Allies after the war. It's just strange it took them so long to make it work. But here it is, Panzerabwehrrakete X7. Definitely something uh, to keep in mind when you talk about high-tech German technology, considering how early in the war they had such a thing. And of course you have the Panzerschreck which was originally a smaller 88.8 centimeter rocket fired from, well, literally a mock-up of the American bazooka the Germans had acquired pieces of in Tunisia. One major problem, which is why it ended up being referred to as the stovepipe, was the American bazooka, which was only 60 millimeters, its rocket would fire, but it would extinguish before it left the tube. Not so much on the Panzerschreck. The rocket would stop burning two meters outside the tube, which means the wearer had to wear heavy gloves and goggles, gas masks, poncho to not get burned or suffocate in the noxious fumes. That was eventually remedied by a shield, a shorter, more effective barrel of the Panzerschreck. Again, but it was a problem uh, having huge pieces of smoke illuminate exactly from where the rocket came when you fired at the tank, it's sort of lighting you up a little bit for the enemy, saying, here I am, I'm the little guy sitting with a stovepipe in the middle of the uh, plume of smoke, and firing them uh, in uh, close combat, fighting in, in cities, firing them inside a room would fill the room of, uh, well, toxic smoke. Also, rather bad for your health, I'm sure. They made a bigger brother version of uh, the Panzerschreck, which was a 10.5 centimeter. It was originally an 18 kilo monster um, that weighed, the projectile alone weighed 6.1 kilogram, shaped hollow charge, eight round. Uh, about 300 meter range, which was a good idea. It'll get further and further away from the end user. Now this projectile weighed 6.1 kilograms and was effective up to 300 meters. Uh, armor protection was well, uh, 180 millimeters at a 60 degree impact angle. This was rejected and instead they made something better and a little shorter and a little lighter. Well, imagine that. A 240 millimeter penetration was requested and the next model had a shorter tube 200 centimeters long. It only weighed uh, about 13 kilograms and the new projectile now weighed only 6.3 kilograms, mm, about 13 pounds per projectile. Still, a bit of weight if you're going to drag it around all your other kit. Anyway, shape charge as usual. This ended up with an armor penetration of 220 millimeters against a 60 degree sloped armor. Problem is, being a shorter barrel, it recoil was a little bit of a thing, which was a problem considering this was a recoilless weapon. So they had to start putting them on smaller, lighter mounts, which having covered the area in smoke made it less desirable to use and a little harder to move because after firing you would have to change position. Which of course brings us to the Donkey Faust that I've been wanting to say for so long, which is for all intents and purposes a cruel and evil hoax perpetrated by German soldiers in Italy. Although it's not entirely that funny because throughout most of the wars animals have been used to mount weapons, drag weapons, or have weapons strapped to them in order to run and detonate themselves amongst the enemy. 
So entirely funny, it is really not, and I am not talking about the bomb dogs the Russians used, because I'm not ruining my day by looking at that study. This picture was probably taken in Italy, or where donkeys were extensively used in the mountains by just about everybody who fought in the mountains, World War I, World War II, to drag heavy equipment with them. And it's not uh, unthinkable that a whole lot of Panzerfausts were carried on the back of donkeys uh, with the German mountain troops uh, towards the end of the wars they were fighting in Italy. Whether one was fired from the back of a donkey, I'm pretty sure the donkey would have been extensively annoyed by such an attempt, kicked the user, and run the F away. Just just thinking. But still, uh, it isn't... Ah, hell, let's go. It's a little funny. At least humor among soldiers during wartime is what gets everybody through that particular time of their lives. And, um, yeah, I always said... Um, a deep and dark source of sarcastic humor is what gets us through life. So if you don't understand sarcasm, well, go away. Now, of course, in modern warfare, one of the key component problems is how does a soldier meet popsicle manage to destroy combat and defend himself against armored tanks that would relatively easily roll over him? In 41, the Germans had a Panzerhandgranaten, armored hand grenade, two kilos, with a penetration about 130 millimeters. About half a million or so was made, and further developments continued with different upgrades. Of course, with this meant you had to come up right next to the enemy armor, which again might at times prove very unhealthy to your general health and well-being. So, there's different ways of they, they worked on with this. One was as a sticky grenade concept, with a filt uh, in front of the uh, mine. Of course, we're talking about the regular shaped charge. In front of it, with a felt dipped in glue, the soldier would come up and stick this to the side of the, the enemy tank, hoping it wouldn't fall off right away, or he wouldn't get stuck to his uniform. Um, set the detonator, you'd, you'd pull the cap in 7.5 seconds before it exploded. Uh, sticky bomb or not, that would eventually in the Big Brother be replaced by magnets that some of you who have suffered through my movies seen I placed on the side of a piece of armor once, because we have one sitting here somewhere, um, of the Big Brother. There was another way of trying to attach uh, shape charges to uh, tank or detonate them. The problem with the shape charge, it has to be right on. So the shrapnel would make the little pin of the hole and make a whole lot of cooking inside the tank possible. They would also do the Panzerwurf Mina. Russians had a version of this that was eventually even used up to decades after World War II with a little parachute. You would throw it uh, over the tank and it would cascade down and land, uh, hopefully, shape first onto the back of the tank. So many things can go wrong, including weather with a little parachute that you still have to throw and has to aim and hit precise. Still, 200,000 of these were made and deployed in the field, and I have no idea how successful they were, because there are no stories. Maybe that's an account of self, that there are no surviving accounts of how well these things were. Still little handkerchief after a grenade. I'm not liking the idea. Neither did the SS. So they developed what was well, a HL Hankanaten, which became known as the SS HL Hankanaten, just because you need to write more things in manuals. Uh, it was about 19 centimeter long and weighed about 420 grams and included a shape charge of 210 grams and a diameter of about 7.2 centimeters. Eventually, developments came into a Panzer Han Mine. Han means you are still delivering the damn thing by hand. Back to that again. Um, it had somewhere a shape charge between three and four hundred grams. It was not too successful, but it, it led to the first actual usable weapon, the Panzer Han Mine III which had a sort of a bottle shape and about 27 centimeters long with a diameter of 14 centimeters, 
three strong magnets was on, on the side to fix the weapon to the side of the tank again. It carried a thousand gram shape charge penetrating about 130 millimeters of armor. Eventually this was succeeded by the Panzer Hanmina 4 which was a little bigger, strong magnets and improved penetration up to 150 millimeters. Eventually that was succeeded by a larger weapon. See where this is going. But the Hofladung 3 was the one they ended up going with. It had a 7.5 second fuse, shaped charge and 1.7 kilograms of weight total which was now three and a half kilos of the um, of course it was all about how to fight all this motorized armor coming at you so they also tried a hand grenade that was filled with Motorstopp middle or a fine flaky sand type substance that would be sucked into the engine of a tank or a vehicle causing the engine to stop of course it would have to be deployed right over the, the air intake um, that didn't always really work uh, actually it never really worked it, it didn't it, the hand grenade with, with dust over filters that didn't work so they tried another one uh, hand grenade with ozone that sh if it was deployed over the filters of a vehicle it would choke the engine which it didn't but you, you gotta try things otherwise you don't know that they won't work so the whole idea of uh, activating something uh, dusty, finey powder to stop the enemy vehicle engines, yeah, that was that was stopped rather quickly. But it was an interesting idea, right? Of course, there was various experimentations with different mounts for stick grenades, where you would put them in a canister holding seven to multiply the explosion, and if done right over the filters of an enemy tank, it theoretically should be able to uh, destroy or disable the engine as you may also have seen me do in one of the better movies I've made no comments it was tried they tried it bite me okay <laughs> uh, another thing they did with the stick grenade the potato masher is encase it in cement Make a, they even made a cement version, a concrete stick grenade, which could also be labeled as the Volks grenade. You could also see this as coming towards the end of the war with a significant lack of resources, although the stick grenade really was not the most expensive or complicated thing to make. They also made one that was made of cement. Again, it would send out fragments and explode. So it's entirely possible, and very few of them still exist for obvious reasons. Some of the cement was even encased with particles of, of, um, of metal that you at some point, if you're lucky to find one, might be rusting through the cement wall of the grenade. But they are rare if you're out there doing battlefield excavation and you find a cement stick grenade. Uh, hang on to it, because it's a rarity. Also, they would roll stick grenades and other grenades into what you would call look like a bowling ball all the way up to a 30 kilogram Rollkanaten rolling grenade that was made in metal or they would also be made in cement pretty much most countries made something like this so you stick a relatively small charge and you encase it in, uh, in cement or steel or shrapnel and you roll it off towards the enemy 30 kilogram explosive bowling ball I'm not that good of a bowler, but it seems like something you'd want to be further away from that you can roll. There was also smaller and lighter versions of these, especially, like I said, if you come to the end of the war, more and more improvisation was needed, and we'll get to that when we get to uh, the weapons issued at the end of the war to the uh, civilians of the Volkssturm, which actually was rather interesting, simple, but rather functional weaponry. So, of course, they would have a Volkskanat and a Volkspistol. I will say the concrete stick grenade was somewhat interesting because quite a few have been found. They would have the regular wooden handle um, with the groove running down the length inside the handle where the cord was, where you would pull the fuse, you had the regular TNT inside, and then it was uh, covered by a small piece of waterproof paper over cardboard square where you would have the explosive inside and then it would be uh, covered by by cement either in a form um, or in a concrete mold 
And we'll have the regular standard BC24 friction pull fuse uh, having a delay of four or five seconds. So it was pretty much, for all intents and purposes, a stick grenade that was just made of cement, regular TNT, uh, demolition charge inside. Cheap and easy, I suppose. There was more to the Volks Hankanaten 45 than just a revised stick grenade out of cement. Resources were at the end of the war, like I said, rather scarce, and they had to change the parameters. But they needed to equip the Volkssturm, which was basically hastily trained civilians to defend their own areas. And they had to be equipped with weaponry and grenades as well. So a, a grenade that was cheaper and yet functional than the stick grenade had to be made quickly, cheaply, and with a shortage of resources. Uh, resources. So they made them in glass canisters or thinner metal, but predominantly the uh, glass Volkssturm Granaten was made with a, um, a BCE-39 fuse which was originally designed for the German egg grenade. So the fuse was existing technology. The layout of, of the grenade was similar to the top of the stick grenade but without the stick. And it had to be hand thrown, hands on the canister. And there was different fuses of different lengths. Then the glass canisters to make up for shrapnel, which was you have about 150 grams of powder, but you would fill it with glass, metal offcuts, whatever that would be functional as anti personnel shrapnel would be filled in the canister, or as when they were made with cement mixed in with the cement. So you'd have that outer core of shrapnel when, when thrown. And of course, Transportation was an issue if it was a cement grenade because that would absorb moisture. So they had to be packed in watertight crates. One factory uh, managed to produce 100, 700 and some 39,000 of these. And this was again outsourced to different companies. And they were all slightly different. So having them built to one specification was not always possible. So several different variations of these uh, Volks Handgranaten existed. And they were also issued to the regular army and even the SS towards the end of the war, just to cover the need of having the anti-personnel grenade. And just to show you something that is uh, pretty, that's not really a weird weapon, but I want to show you the 27mm double-barreled flare pistol that the German Navy used. Not that it's really a specific super phenomenal weapon, but it is a beautiful flare, flare gun. It's a beautiful design, it's, it's just a great looking um, piece of equipment, and I just wanted to show it to you because, well, I don't know any other double-barreled flare pistols from ever. Uh, it had a range about 260 feet and a 9-inch barrel, loaded like a shotgun, uh, internal hammers. Still, just wanted to show you something pretty before we go on to something else. The Solotron S18-100, 20mm anti-tank cannon, or as it's listed, anti-material weapon. I don't know what else it would really be. I don't know why I missed this on some of my previous breakdowns of anti-tank weapons because this was based on a something really, really cool. It was built by Rheinmetall in 1940 for the Finnish army, paid for out of Switzerland. And it was using a, well, an S-18 350mm anti-aircraft cannon munition, which was 20 by 105 had a muscle velocity of 765 uh, feet per second, which is not, well, you know, it's okay, I guess. So, 735 meters a second is the muscle velocity, which is okay. And the penetration at 100 meters was uh, 20 millimeter of sloped armor at 60 degrees, which is okay. I actually would have thought a little bit more, and I think maybe with some improvement it could have done better. Uh, being an anti-aircraft uh, munition. Anyway, what makes this special is that it was a bullpup design with no fixed sights, so you had a binocular sight. It weighed 45 kilograms and had a vertical magazine of 5, or more commonly 10, sticking out the side of the gun. Um, the Germans produced it, 
and they had them in four trials, but apparently they didn't like it enough to actually put it into use, which is a little bit of a shame because it, it looks rather cool. And back of my mind, I keep thinking more could have been achieved. Well, I mean, no, I want to say more, I don't mean more recoil because it had an enormous kick of a mule. Yeah, we're back to the mules again, I, I don't know. Um, I think with a little more work, this could have uh, gone somewhere. Anyway, I think I wanted to bring it to you because it's, well, it was made in Germany at the time and they tested it. There you go. Oddly enough, it was used by a lot of other militaries, a lot of other countries. Uh, Hungary, Italy, uh, Romania. This thing went you know, in 20, 30 different countries. And it's also been produced in Estonia right up until the Russian invasion, but they only managed to make 20. So that, well, never mind on that one. But still. Now, I know we paddled down the river of flare guns, but here's an actual flare gun that became an actual weapon that was actually a little special. It had different munitions, and I kind of like it. It's called the Sturmpistol. I remember when the Germans really were hard up for something? You stick Sturm in front of it, and then it's just automatically cool. The Sturmpistol was more assault pistol. Let's just translate. What the heck? Right? It was an early war suggestion of how you would take a, a flare gun that could be used by anybody and use it against armor or explosive or smoke or basically doing anything else except popping up flares, which it would also do, including signal flares. Haha, -ha. see? Multi purpose weaponry, that's always good. The Sturmpistol, it was, well, initially a uh, big breech-loading pistol that was set for illumination, target marketing, uh, or concealing with smoke. It would fire smoke. It really cannot have been a whole lot of smoke, but all right, fine. Let's go back to the target marketing, because that sounds more interesting. Um, later in the war, it developed explosive rounds, and they would have a lightweight grenade launcher so you can engage targets at relatively close range. And there was even a buttstock that was uh, made, kind of a conversion kit for it, so you can fire different grenades of it because they apparently kick a little more. There was, what it was originally made for was a multi-star cartridge which would send up signal flares of reds and greens or different configurations so you could have pre-designated UBC2 green and six red, you know you're attacking and something else, something else, something else. That was interesting, but not as interesting as you could have a, a Wurfgranat in Patrone 326. That was a small, it was breech loaded, fin stabilized explosive grenade with a nose fuse. <laughs> it was designed for short range or low angle direct fire missions and it was not recommended beyond 200 yards, 180 meters. It was accurate above that and you really shouldn't use it in less than 46 meters 50 yards because it might endanger yourself to shrapnel. Now if you have a little grenade like that you fire from a pistol that will send shrapnel up to 50 meters. That's not bad. It's lightweight, it's uh, easy to carry, munitions are not that heavy. Not bad at all. There was also one an anti-tank uh, weaponry or a heat round with a shaped charge that will be used against enemy armor uh, about 70 meters away, so you're still pretty danger close. And it would only penetrate uh, 80 millimeters of homogeneous armor, um, which, well, you know, you know. Uh, definitely armored vehicles, uh, trucks, cars would certainly have, uh, have had an impact on those. Now, if you take that away and get the really cool thing, you have the Wurz, the Wurfkorper 361. It was screwing a backlight, a wooden stem, into the Eierhandgranaten, which was the German egg grenade. It would actually send the egg grenade flying with, remember, it had a 4.5 second fuse. So you send it at a, hard, at a high arc, an egg grenade flying, it would detonate in air. That would do some damage to all those soft, squishy, meat popsicle soldiers on the other end. Again, use it more than 50 meters away. It was recommended, and it was limited to about 
76 meters distance. But it could shoot grenades, shoot tanks, shoot armor, it was pistol, it was light. Why did we not have more of those? I like it. I like it a lot. Now, something that is extremely beautiful and very rare and today very expensive was something that was issued to the German Luftwaffe, the M30 Dreiling. Dreiling because it had three barrels, two 12-gauge barrels and one rifle barrel underneath between them. It's a beautiful rifle. It absolutely is. Uh, the commercial version had 16-gauge shells and the one issued to the Luftwaffe made in 41 to 43 had a 12 gauge. The rifle was a 9.3 by 74 millimeter rifle uh, bullet, soft nose, so not allowed to be fired at people. Ideally, I suppose this would be a good sub Saharan gun. The pilots were issued with uh, an aluminum box with the rifle disassembled with 24 slugs and 24 birdshot and a bunch of rifles, uh, rifle bullets, and a sling. Now, the interesting thing that makes this a little problematic, I suppose, is that this rifle that was issued to the pilots, whereas American pilots had a 45, I believe, ice cold, they had a rifle in a box, disassembled, an aluminum box. This box was to be retrieved after the plane had been crashed and it was a survival rifle for the pilots so they could go hunt and eat after crashing and surviving the crash and having the box in the cockpit survive the crash. See where I'm going with this? Maybe they should have given them a pistol on the leg so they could jump out in a parachute. Because for this, you need to not think of your safety. You need to think of your rifle and gently touch down the plane that is about to crash having been only partially shot down. Uh, and I'm sure having this beautifully well-designed hunting style rifle might have been inspired just ever so slightly by Hermann Goering's fondness for hunting, being the Reich Huntmeister. Uh, but it is, a, it is a beautiful rifle. I just thought it was interesting that you issue a rifle to pilots that they can't take with them if they decide to jump out. So, I guess why give them a parachute when they have a rifle? One thing that happened during the invasion of Crete where the German airborne troops that landed there did not fare too well against the heavily armed British troops on the ground. One of the problems the German airborne had was their parachutes. The way they were designed, they literally had to land on their, on their hands and knees and roll around, which meant they could only carry small 9mm MPs, MP40s, pistols. Everything else would have to be dropped in canisters like they're heavy weapons. And sometimes, as it is, you get separated from your weaponry, from the heavy canisters. After that, the Luftwaffe was looking for a heavy select fire weaponry that could be carried by airborne troops. Fair enough. Uh, Adolf Hitler was not impressed at all by how things went in Crete and did not really want to see any more airborne assaults and lose that many people. However, Hermann Göring himself continued the development and the production of what became the FG-42, which really is the granddad for the M60. This is a great looking rifle, side mounted magazine of 10 and 20 rounds. It was fielded 792 by 57 about 600 meters efficient range. It was specifically made for telescopic sights of the CFG-42 or the CF-4, uh, but it also had metal flip-up sights. But this was like the combat version of the M60. It had a bayonet, tripod, pistol grip. The only problem there really was, was that by a full-sized munition, rifle munition, and a side-mounted magazine, if you fill it up with 20 rounds, the magazine will stick out a bit, and that would not do stability a whole lot. And on full auto-fire, uh, control would be somewhat of an issue, so the muscle blast deflector had to be, the flash suppressor had to be rebuilt. 
they designed a specific flash suppressor for this, which inevitably also became an issue for the later post-war American rifle designs and solved the problem in a similar manner. Now, these weapons were predominantly issued to the Fallschirmjäger, as they were originally attended, and during the Battle of Caratan and Falaise pocket, nearly a quarter of all FG-42s were in the hands of the 2nd Parachute Division, and they were seen there specifically. It was a select fire, air-cooled, one of the first to incorporate the straight-line recoil configuration. The layout combined with the Sayed magazine, uh, well, the problem is it placed the center of gravity and the position of the shoulder stock nearly in line with the longitude axle of the bore, featuring increasing controllability during burst and automatic fire. Like I said, things that had to be rebailed, and if you were thought a little further, you had made this weapon belt-fed. It would have been lighter, it would have been easier to control, better stabilization. Belt-fed, this would have been an amazing weapon, absolutely. But still, uh, still today, it was incredibly well-built, well-designed. They were not uh, they were not produced in the same number as the STG-44, or certainly or the Mauser, because they were specifically made for the, uh, for the Luftwaffe, for the Fallschirmjäger. However, for those of you who are now watching these pictures of this really, really cool World War II uh, rifle, or automatic rifle, a semi-automatic version is being produced today, a replica is being made, and I'll see if I can find the information for you. I do believe they start at about $2,500, so they are not cheap, but uh, at least you can get the feel of carrying one around today. And in a response to the German Army call for cheap weapons programs, of cheap but efficient weapons to make up for, well, production shortages and material shortages towards the end of the war, again feeding into the Volkssturm that needed to be supplied with weapons, possibly as a knockoff or response to the PPSH-41, or even to the Sten with its welded, cheap metal parts, Elma Werke came up with the EMP-44. And, no, not that EMP. This was a gun that fired uh, 9mm rounds. It would actually feed from the dual MP40 magazine well, so it would take MP40 magazines and have two of them side by side. However, it was crudely made, the buttstock was of welded pipes, it was efficient up to 100-200 meters, a standard 9mm uh, submachine gun, uh, or submachine pistol range. The German army looked at it and went, nah, they mm, too crude, too cheap, don't like it and it was discontinued. But 15 production numbers were actually made, or of course, prototypes. It's not pretty, but if it was efficient and cheap to make, it would have a time and place. Back to some of the Wulchsturm weaponry, because most of you haven't heard of them, and some of them are actually rather cool, like the Wulchsturmgewehr VG-1, which was basically a bolt-operated uh, rifle with a 10-round magazine that would fit the, uh, uh, the automatic Gewehr 43. So you had a decent round of ammunition, and you, again, utilized uh, magazines that were already in production. It was then an 8 by 57 millimeter round uh, bolt action, and it was built in the Czech Bruno Weapons Works. That was one that was made for the uh, German Volkssturm. Don't have many, much more information about how many were made and what happened to them. And of course, if we're going to say VG-1, we're going to have to say VG-2 as well, which was another Volkssturm Gewehr with the same magazine feed. It was a bolt-action rifle with a rotary cylinder bridge. It was manufactured the last part of the World War II, not sure how many. It had a steel plate uh, for breech, and the visor was not adjustable. It had is this, the same magazine of the 43 with a 10-round magazine. It was roughly pressed, and all parts were manufactured and assembled with a high tolerance only. Mm. Um, 
it was effective at shorter firing distances, which is surprising because it was a 7x92mm. It should have been able to go up to a bit of a distance, but again, for the very lightly trained Volkssturm, they were going to be pressed against the Russians at relatively close ranges. It was easy to treat, easy to train, easy to use, uh, accurate enough for the time. And then we fast forward to 45, but not really. It's the Volkssturm Karbine 45. Semi-automatic, uh, same ammunition as the uh, Sturmgewehr 44, so the munition was being made. It had a 30 round magazine and it was a little semi-automatic MP, really, that was supposed to be made a lot of, cheaply, fast, easy to the Volkssturm. It, there's not much to say about it. It was pretty roughly assembled, made by stamped parts, and uh, only a few cast and machine parts uh, were used, as uh, few as possible at least. Um, it had a 7x92 cartridge, like I said, same as the uh, STG44. It was a bit primitive, but uh, again, it could have done the job, and I have no numbers of how many of them were manufactured or even if there is one. But it might be one that would be worth looking into uh, doing a reproduction run of uh, reenactors or those of us would be interested in how uh, those weapons actually function, how much they held up. Some of those little used weaponry at the end of the war that was literally uh, ripped off based on Sten guns and whatever else we could have, sort of like the uh, Winnipeg SPC, that was supposed to have been designed at the end of the war by reputable firms, no existing uh, models are, uh, exist, no versions exist of, uh, of the Vimespec, except there's a drawing and then there's some interesting mock-ups because it's been adopted for computer games. But quick, easy and cheap, I guess, was the catchphrase of the day. And if that had actually gone to manufacturing, I don't think it would have been much cheaper than that as a complete cheap rip-off of the Sten which the Germans did. And speaking of, here goes the Potsdam, the German version of the Sten. A 9mm, 3 kilograms of weight, 32 round magazine of regular 9mm. This is pretty much as close as it gets to uh, the Sten. It was a good idea, it was cheap and easy, and again at the end of the war it could have seen its place. Of those, I don't want one. but. It existed, and there it is. That was a few words about some of the German special, different, or lesser known infantry weapons of World War II that I could sort of dig up in between doing everything else I'm trying to do for you guys. There's more, and more on this will uh, come round. And Daniel, I got your requests while I was in the middle of doing this. Um, I think it was called something else. And I think I found what it could be. And I'm going to expand the German Strange Weapons a little bit in episodes to come. Uh, there's... I'm trying to find out which... Just trying to make the decision of what speculation uh, should go under a Q&A single topic. Or what should go into my... Uh, last Nazi secret uh, series because we are still uh, shooting and editing on that and there's still a lot more conclusions to come. What I think I'm gonna do is do you guys four or eight episodes uh, depending how long they're gonna be. You know me, I try to put everything in there and I try to show you everything that I see because I think it's important if I walk through a place that gives me conclusions from what I'm seeing, I need to show you what it is I'm basing my conclusions on. So I'm not just pulling it out by giving you a single clip here and there. That's the wonderful thing about what we can do here on YouTube, is I can take the time and show you everything I'm seeing. Whereas if uh, we were doing this purely for TV, and the TV episodes will be considerably shorter, because you know you have to go to conclusion to conclusion. Here I can take you with me all the way through the journey. And if you come and we're talking about German specialty weapons uh, that somehow have morphed into modern weapons of today, I think they might be long there. Uh, I will try to make some sort of a 
to educated guess based on my limited brain capacity. Anyway, you all have a wonderful, amazing Thanksgiving. I'm going to spend most of it either uh, feeding people or I will be sitting in front of my computer presenting more episodes to you. Please do me a favor and uh, besides liking the videos, see if you can't uh, share, share what I'm doing here because the more followers I get and the more people who see some of the video documentaries that we are all doing here together, I could sit here and answer your questions if you didn't send them to me. And uh, the more followers I get, the more we get on uh, up in um, the front page, and the more commercial revenue I make, that I always flip into my next trip out there. That's why I, I can do this because of the commercials that you are forced to see. Um, because like I said, I'm not, there's no uh, donate button here and there's no studio paying. So when I go overseas and I film things, that's the uh, YouTube revenue. And the more followers, the more of that. And the better equipment I can bring, some of you have mentioned ground penetrating radar and things like that. They all turn into a little bit of money. I would love to bring a team with me when I go back to, in the spring, back to Lower Silesia. And uh, I'm not done with Komastorf. Don't even think it. Uh, you guys don't know half of what happened there. But we're not done yet. And it will be, it will be better if I brought more people uh, both technicians and techs and soldiers and uh, where I, where we're going, mountain goats, and uh, you will all see um, what I'm talking about.